and thank you for joining us for another live session. Again, I said I'll just check that we're live. Please say hi in the comments. Let us know that you're watching. For anyone who's not joined before, my name is Zoe Clark. I'm a programme officer and I'm de delighted to be joined today by Rosie Barnett. And Rosie is a researcher and PhD student at the University of Bath and the Royal National Hospital for Rheumatic Diseases. So hi, Rosie. Thanks so much for joining. Hi, thank you so much for inviting me. I've been really looking forward today to today. <laughs> yeah, I'm really looking forward. I've had a sneak peek of your presentation. I'm really excited for you to share it with everyone. Ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so today, Rosie will be updating us on Project Nightingale study um, and also chatting a little bit about apps that you can use for your health and well-being, and particularly for Axial Spa as well. Um, so Rosie, to start with, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so as you said, um, I'm a PhD student and researcher at the University of Bath and I work largely within the Department for Health, but also across the Department of Computer Science um, within the Bath Spondyloarthritis Research Consortium. So it's a group of multidisciplinary um, researchers and also healthcare professionals dedicated to research um, for axial spondyloarthritis or AXFA. So yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you all today. <laughs> Brilliant, thanks again. So um, yeah, as, as always, please pop uh, your questions in the comments box as we go along. Um, so Rosie will be doing the presentation, then we'll come back on for a Q&A at the end and go through all the comments and questions. So please pop anything in there as we go. I'll just check, see how many people we've got joining us so far. Um, and the video will stay on the page, so don't worry if you can't watch the whole session. You can come back and catch up afterwards, either on this page or on my AS My Life as well. So Rosie, I think um, if you're happy to get started, I'll let you um, share your slides. And what I'll do is at the end, I'll pop um, the link to Project Nightingale in the video description. And I've put a link to your Twitter there as well, so people can keep in touch um, with you and with the, the project as well. Oh, excellent. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, everyone, hopefully you can see my um, screen okay. So as Zoe mentioned, I'm going to be talking today about smartphone apps and particularly how they can support our health and also um, potentially the management of axial spondyloarthritis or AXFA, which includes ankylosing spondylitis. So I've split up my talk into three main sections. So first, I'm going to talk a bit more generally about how smartphone apps can help us to look after our health. And then I'm going to talk about, a bit about my research. So specifically how we are currently using apps and remote monitoring in Bath at the RNHRD, how we hope to use apps in future. And then excitingly, finally, how you can get involved in an exciting new project. And then finally, I'm going to talk to you a bit more about apps available to you now, specifically for AXBAR. So smartphone apps and our health, how exactly can smartphone apps help us look after our health? Well, I've put four main aspects on the screen here. So we've got diagnosis, self-management, healthcare delivery and research and some examples of each. So NAS are doing amazing work with Good Boost currently um, developing an app that will hopefully help use artificial intelligence to support diagnoses in, um, in suspected AXFA and also help with monitoring of posture and range of movement. White Swan as well are an amazing charity. Um, they're actually the charity arm of a company called Black Swan Data. And they're currently working on a project called the Million Minds app. And this will potentially um, help with the diagnosis of rare diseases in future. And they're using big data. So data from millions of people um, to try and look at sort of various um, people's um, consultations and symptoms that might be seen and then leading to an eventual diagnosis to help people with the diagnosis of rare diseases and help people get the support that they need sooner. So in terms of self-management, I've put three main apps here that are specifically for inflammatory arthritis, which I'm going to talk about in a bit more detail um, at the end of this talk as well. And that's MySpa, My Arthritis and the Versus Arthritis Activity Tracker. 
And I've also put on here as well the Bearable app. And although the Bearable app hasn't actually been developed specifically for any conditions, it does actually allow for remote monitoring and you can choose specific symptoms to monitor, monitor via the app. And as well, if you have a wearable device really coolly, you can actually link the um, device to your Google Fit account if you have one and then link the Google Fit to the Bearable app so that it can automatically um, track, I believe, sleep data and also step data, which is really cool. In terms of actual, actual healthcare delivery, there are actually some apps now available that can help with delivery of healthcare services. So I've put here Mind District and the Dr. Julian app as examples, and they're helping actually provide um, so, sort of access to psychologists and also counseling and therapists via apps. So in-app text messaging services and video calling services with counselors and therapists. And Dr. Julian um, actually allows you to download the app for free and then you can have private consultations. I believe it's around 60 pound an hour um, with a therapist or counselor. And then they also have NHS streams as well via the um, iApp services. So improving access to psychological therapies. And I believe some iApp services do offer um, these apps as well in terms of sort of improving access to those services and again reducing wait times which is really important for again help helping people get the help that they need um, and getting support sooner and it's worth me mentioning here as well that iapt are actually still running during coronavirus and you can actually self-refer yourself to iapt without going via your gp so if you just type into google iapt self-referral um, you can actually get led through a process um, through the nhs and you should be assessed within about four weeks and hopefully get access to help if you need it finally we can also use apps for research and I've put here Project Nightingale which is our app at the RNHRD that we're using for research into AXFAR that I'm going to talk to you about today. There's also the University of Manchester who are doing amazing work looking at smartphone apps and they've done quite a few um, projects so you might have heard of Cloudy with a Chance of Pain which looked at chronic pain and how pain might be impacted by the weather which was a really exciting study and the results of that have actually been published now as well. Some of you may have even taken part in it. And then also some of you may be taking part in the King's College London COVID Zoe symptom tracking app. And they actually were one of the, um, through the app, they were one of the first places that actually identified the loss of sense of taste and smell as one of the key symptoms of COVID. So it shows really how smartphone apps are being used even in the current pandemic um, to sort of help with health and help us learn about a condition. So talking more about specific app features, one of the things that apps can help us with is remote monitoring. So they can facilitate accurate day-to-day -day tracking of symptoms and behaviour in order to hopefully help you gain a better understanding of your condition and also help your clinician help you better manage your condition potentially through again having this accurate record um, between clinical consultations. They can also, through remote monitoring, help you set and keep track of goals, for example, through wearables. As for example, I know we all know that exercise one is, is one of the most important things that you can do to look after your axe bar. However, knowing that something's good for us and actually doing something that's good for us um, can be two very different things. I'm, I'm also, I can sometimes be the queen of self-sabotage um, in that aspect when it comes to getting outside, but having a wearable device and sort of setting yourself a goal can be really useful in terms of having that motivation um, to get out there and sort of get your steps up but also during this time particularly it's really important not to overdo it and and do remember to be kind kind to yourself if you don't happen to meet those goals a lot of apps also have educational aspects so you can learn a bit more about your condition and potentially have information on medication and various exercises that you can do and flare management, um, watching stretching and exercise tutorials and also as well keeping up to date with research and news stories. A lot of apps are trying to also incorporate a social aspect, so some link directly to social media, but also you can potentially connect with friends and um, share your goals and share experiences and obviously sharing experiences is so important for feeling supported. You can also potentially find activities or groups in your area, which obviously at the moment um, may not be quite so relevant, but I think a lot of support groups are actually um, sort of providing some sort of online support as well, which is great. And hopefully sort of by June, maybe potentially some of these things will be a bit more relevant. 
And nowadays there really is an app for everything. So um, there are various apps out there for mindfulness and there is actually quite a lot of evidence now to suggest that mindfulness might be beneficial in conditions um, that have sort of chronic pain aspects and mindfulness-based interventions might actually be able to reduce pain and improve quality of life and mental health um, as well. So I believe a couple of weeks ago, um, Dave Smithson from Anxiety UK actually mentioned that um, via Anxiety UK, you can actually get a free subscription to one of these mindfulness apps called Headspace. So that is potentially something worth looking into. And there are, of course, other apps available as well, such as Calm, for example. There are other apps such as How to so Stop Smoking, which may be useful if that's something that you're trying to look into. And of course, yoga and other interests as well. So moving on to my research specifically, so I have a lot of interests, um, particularly in terms of looking at holistic rehabilitation and long term outcomes from that and trying to optimise accessibility of treatments and techniques for treatments and potentially using remote monitoring and digital interventions to identify individuals who may most benefit from certain treatments. And again, sort of improving access to this treatments and ensuring people get the support that they need early on. So most of my interests um, fall into these two main areas. So looking at digital interventions and potential moderation of health related behavior. So I'm really interested in looking at how digital interventions may support um, certain aspects of basic psychological needs and psychological theory and how that may in turn moderate health related behavior. And then also um, remote monitoring for research in healthcare, which we're of course going to talk about today. So initially, I'm going to talk a bit about Project Nightingale. So I'll give a bit of an overview about what Project Nightingale is, one of the studies that we're running at the RNHRD, and talk then about insights that we have gained from this two year daily self report data from the Project Nightingale app. And then I'm going to go in to talk a bit more about future work. So development of a novel app for AXBAR, which actually you can get involved with. So what exactly is Project Nightingale? So Project Nightingale, as I've touched upon already, is a smartphone data capture platform, so an application called Umotif, that allows you to monitor daily symptoms and behaviour. And this has actually been running since April 2018, so we have almost a three-year detailed data set for daily self-reported symptoms. And we have this for approximately 200 people, so this is a really novel, exciting data set that hopefully we can gain some really interesting insights from. So this is what the app actually looks like. And as you can see, it's designed to look like a flower and each of the petals represents a symptom or behavior. So all individuals track eight core variables and that includes things such as flare, fatigue, mood, stress, sleep, recommended exercise, and also use of an anti-inflammatory medication. And then individuals also choose from two option, also choose two optional variables from a list. So this includes stuff such as menstrual cycles, smoking, smoking, caffeine intake, screen time, and then they just track these each day. So each day you ask how you're feeling, and you just drag the petal out to how you're feeling. And each petal, well, most of the petals are rated on a five-point scale. And it acts as a visual metaphor. So the fuller the petal, the better the outcome. Individuals can also sync the app to a wearable device, which then automatically tracks steps and also sleep data. Individuals can also complete the daily questionnaire and diary. So the daily questionnaire is mainly used for research and it just provides a lot more granular information about medication and exercise. And then the diary is just for anything else that you think may be relevant to your condition. So, for example, um, if you have a, a big life event that you want to record, Individuals can then use the My Data portion of the app to explore symptom patterns and behaviour correlations. And unfortunately, in the Project Nightingale app itself, um, this only actually shows data for 90 days, but we do actually have um, all of your data stored. So if you do want to access your data and you are participating in Project Nightingale at the RNHRD, please do get in contact with me and we can send you a full data readout. There's also an online community, um, so www.projectnightingale.org, and this is actually accessible to anyone. So Project Nightingale itself is only accessible um, for individuals who are with the RNHRD, but the website is obviously just a website and anyone can go and take a look, look at it. So here we have various resources, links to events, and also here we post any publications that come from the Project Nightingale dataset. 
We also have a blog as well. So I post regularly on the blog, usually a minimum of once a month, but often every two weeks. And again, this is an opportunity for anyone to, to have a look at. So in terms of research and our current work, at the moment, we've been focusing on gaining a novel understanding of flare experience. So a lot of previous researchers focused on um, characterizing flare based on retrospective flare experience. So asking people what flare is like for them, but this is actually real time monitoring. So it's looking at that daily, really granular data as to what, what is actually happening at the time. And I'm about to show you some of our data that we've recently submitted as a manuscript looking at characterization of flare. And this really lays, lays the foundation for our future work and potentially looking into whether we can predict flares based on this daily self-report data. And then also looking at resolution of flares. So is there certain things that people do to help resolve a flare quicker? And then finally, the consequence of these flares. So um, it is thought that perhaps sort of more severe flare early on in disease can be a poor prognosis factor and lead to worse outcomes down the line, but it hasn't been investigated in much detail, so we can potentially look at this in future. We're also trying to look at um, looking at sort of how effective certain interventions are in terms of impacting those daily symptoms before, during and after treatment. And in terms of exploratory work as well, we're quite interested in looking at the impact of the pandemic on daily self-report data and other health related behaviours as well on symptom patterns. So we're actually working with the Institute of Mathematical Innovation at the University of Bath to hopefully collaborate and do a bit more detailed analyses on this data. So the first thing that I'm going to talk to you about is symptom correlation. So the results here, obviously it looks a bit intense seeing this gigantic table, um, but this was from an abstract that we recently um, had published in Rheumatology, and we were looking at correlations between various variables collected in the app. So for example here, the number shows the strength of the correlation. So for example, if you're in pain, what other, what other variables are present? So um, here you can see that pain and fatigue seem to be related, as well as stress, um, pain and stress, I'm sorry, pain and sleep and pain and mood, and also other variables not seen in that spa, so hot flushes and pain and hot flushes and fatigue, as well as confidence and self-management and smoking. And the stars next to the numbers show whether or not that result was statistically significant. So those results highlighted in orange I've just picked out. Um, it's quite interesting to see the relationships, for example, between pain and mood, fatigue and mood, sleep and mood and recommended exercise and mood. So on to flare characterization. Um, these are results from the manuscript that we've just submitted these this week. And we were looking at um, what's the difference in sort of variables during flare and off flare. So we looked at pain, for example, and it seems to be that on average from this data set of approximately 200 people, it seems that during flare pain was worse than, um, of course, when not in flare by approximately minus 0.7 um, out of that five, um, that five point Likert scale. And if I go along, it seems that the results were significant. So pain, fatigue, sleep, um, recommended ex exercise, mood and stress were all significantly worse during flare when, than when not in flare. And similarly for the confidence and self-management and also chest pain. So things that haven't yet been explored um, in terms of flare and AXPAR. We then actually used a form of unsupervised machine learning called affinity propagation to try and group people based on their flare experiences. And we actually identified two distinct clusters of people who seem to have different flare experiences. So one group had a shorter, more intense flare experience, so greater worsening of pain, mood, sleep, fatigue and stress. And one group had a more prolonged but less intense flare experience, so um, less great worsening of pain, mood, fatigue, sleep and stress. And this graph shows the difference between the two groups. So the right side of the graph is data from the Project Nightingale app, and the left side of the graph is clinical measures collected routinely at clinical appointments. So for example, spinal mobility or BASME and disease activity, so BASDI. And if you do attend the RNHRD, this is um, information from all of those forms that you fill out at the very beginning, um, just before your appointment. 
And as you can see, you can see the differences between group one and group two from the data from Project Nightingale, but there weren't actually any significant differences in terms of clinical measures. So we think that this suggests that smartphone apps have an ability to capture really subtle changes in disease activity and symptoms that isn't currently captured during routine clinical assessments. So we think perhaps maybe differences between the two groups were to do with treatment history or perhaps diagnosis or time to diagnosis or maybe different disease manifestations. So perhaps peripheral symptoms, presence of chronic widespread pain or presence of extra articular manifestations such as psoriasis and uveitis. And these are all factors that we're hoping to look at in future and potentially submit as an abstract. So hopefully we'll be able to tell you more about that in the future. Between group one and group two, we did actually find the group two had a slightly greater proportion of people with chronic widespread pain, but these results did not reach significance. It's also worth mentioning that we did also look at those other variables, those optional variables, such as, for example, chest pain, confidence and self-management and screen time. And group two, that group with the shorter, more intense flare experience, did also see a much greater worsening of, for example, confidence and self-management, screen time and chest pain during flare, but because of the small sample sizes, these results did not reach statistical significance, so we can't really take too much from that. So I've just put this here, which actually shows all the variables along the bottom, so you can see what all of the um, lines specifically correlate to, but hopefully if this is on YouTube, you'll be able to sort of pause that if you are interested and have a look at in a bit more detail. So moving on to novel app development. So we are at the RNHRD hoping in future to develop our own app. And we're currently sort of in the app concept refinement stage at the moment. Um, so we're really hoping that this app will be able to support people remotely between clinical consultations, empower people to gain a better understanding of their condition. We also really want this to be a tool to facilitate self-management and to support patient-centered consultations through providing a bigger picture of disease experience. We also really want to keep that research element as well going to try and gain a novel understanding of the condition. And we're also considering um, development of potentially an intelligent data collection analytics portal and incorporating this remote monitoring data with the electronic health record. And these ideas are all very much in their infancy, but we are currently at the stage where we're looking to perhaps have some focus groups with people with AXPAR to work out exactly what features the ideal app for AXPAR should have to help you better manage your condition. And I'll put up some contact details for myself um, at the end of this talk as well. So if you are interested in having your say and getting involved, please do get in touch with me and it'll probably be around summertime. Um, I'll be doing hopefully some interviews or some um, focus groups as well to try and define those features. So we really want this to be an app developed by people with AXPAR for people with AXPAR, but with also, of course, input from clinicians. We'll also be taking insights from prior app development um, through a systematic literature review that we're conducting and also from an app called iKwala, um, which is an app that one of my colleagues is um, currently working on for knee osteoarthritis. So again, we need you to help us <laughs> to hopefully develop um, this app. And again, we're just trying to look at um, how to support these different areas. So self-management, perhaps healthcare delivery, and also research. So I thought I'd just provide some um, proof of concepts as well in terms of work that other people have already done. And here again, um, that I'm talking now about the University of Manchester. So they run this study called Remora, which stands for Remote Monitoring of Rheumatoid Arthritis. And this was looking at integrating this daily patient-generated health, health data sorry, from smartphones into the electronic health record. And they actually found that incorporating this daily patient-generated health data into clinical consultations was beneficial both for the clinician and for the patient, as it provided a bigger picture of these accurate, accurate fluctuating symptoms and identified subtle changes that would have been seen otherwise. It's also helped improve recall because obviously there was this detailed list of um, accurate experiences rather than having to try and remember everything that's happened to you. And again, it also enabled patient-centered consultations and shared decision-making as it really legitimized people's experience having this record available to talk about. 
It's also worth me mentioning that because this data was actually integrated with the electronic health record, the graphing functionality and the no switching between symptoms also minimise additional burden to the clinicians. So secondly, I'm going to talk about iKoala, which stands for Intelligent Knee Osteoarthritis Lifestyle App. And this is an app that my colleague, Dr. Simon Jones, has been developing. And again, so they've had people with osteoarthritis and physiotherapists as co-creators and app development to make sure that it's really relevant and useful. And it's currently in the testing phase. And again, it enables remote monitoring to have this accurate collection of um, symptoms. And also really uniquely, it allows for in-app social interactions. So they're currently trying to explore that to enable hopefully supporting a strong sense of relatedness among users. It also provides intelligent physical activity recommendations. So when users log into the app, you're asked to sort of write down your preferences for exercise and ask a couple of questions. And then using um, sort of intelligent, um, intelligent um, models and expert knowledge from clinicians, they then provide you with um, physical activity recommendations based on your preferences and these recommendations. So again, this is currently in the development stage, um, but hopefully we'll see some publications come out on this soon. So to summarise, we now for Project Nightingale at the RNHRD have a novel, unique, granular data set spanning two years. So it really is an incredible opportunity for research and gaining further understanding of the condition through providing personalised insight into day-to-day -day experiences and also allowing us the opportunity to ask complex yet more subtle questions not yet explored in AXFAR. You also have the unique opportunity to collaborate on a novel AXFAR app for self-management and you can be involved both for the design and then hopefully as well um, for the testing of the app if we do manage to deploy this in future. And again, these ideas are very much still in their infancy, um, but I do actually have three years secured funding to work on um, this project as part of my PhD, which is quite exciting. So in terms of available apps that are currently in the App Store for you to use now to support the management of your axial spondyloarthritis, I'm going to talk about three apps in particular, and you'll see that each of them try to support um, the various features that we talked about earlier. So remote monitoring, education, social aspects, and also various other activities. So the first app that I'm going to talk about is MySpa, which was developed by the Barts Health NHS Trust with support from Novartis. And this um, allows for monitoring, as we've spoken about already, educational aspects in terms of information, and also it provides exercise um, videos, and also you can create an exercise plan for yourself. So I won't talk about this in too much detail, but this is actually available for you um, currently now. And I think if you are actually um, sort of with the Barts Health NHS Trust, you can also send data to your clinician and via the contacts section, which is quite cool. The other app that I'm going to talk about is Versus Arthritis Activity Tracker, and this has been specifically developed for teens and young adults or those who are young at heart. And again, this um, allows so self-monitoring, self-tracking, and also recording of additional things similar, I think, to the diary section of the Project Nightingale app, so you can leave notes for yourself. You also get to see a summary of your data. And again, this edu educational aspect, so various information about your condition and also a social aspect as well. So looking at um, sort of groups that are in your area that can perhaps support you as well, which again may not be so relevant at the moment, but hopefully will be really useful in future. The final app that I'm going to talk about is My Arthritis, which I'm super excited about. It's a really new app that's come out and the team who have developed this, um, I just think congratulations to them. It's a, such an amazing thing. And again, we've got those aspects such as monitoring, education and management. But really excitingly, they've actually developed three evidence-based courses to support your condition. So one to do with medication adherence, one to support general well-being, and one introducing concepts of acceptance and commitment therapy, which is a form of cognitive behavioural therapy um, to hopefully help improve your well-being. And each of these courses, I think, is designed to span over two weeks and there's 14 sessions per programme. And again, it's been developed by behavioural scientists and clinicians, so it's really evidence based. So the first, I thought I'd talk through each of those three courses in a bit more detail. So as I mentioned, the first course is general well-being, and this was developed by Dr. Yalise Pryor, who's a clinical therapist and also a researcher working on behavioural interventions for musculoskeletal conditions. And she also lives with arthritis. 
And why was this course developed? So during this course, you can explore how you can promote and maintain good mental health, well-being and general happiness. And it covers aspects such as how inflammatory arthritis and mental health are linked, because, of course, anything that impacts us physically is bound to impact us mentally or emotionally. It also provides steps to well-being and top tips how to improve your well-being and especially sort of drawing on aspects of mindfulness as well and gratitude and acceptance. And as you can see, there's some quotes here from some people who have used the course. Um, so, for example, this course covers so many topics. It's so empowering to do something to improve your own health and well-being. And all of these screenshots here were actually taken from the app um, itself. So hopefully if you are interested in, for example, completing these courses, you can go and take a look at the app after this talk. The second course is to do with medication adherence, and this was designed by Dr. Jonathan Marks, who's a consultant rheumatologist, and also Alison Kent, who's a specialist nurse and also a health coach. And this is mainly focused on trying to sort of help you remember to take your medication and build sort of more of a positive relationship with your medication. So you can see here quotes from people who have taken the course. So I was diagnosed around 10 years ago, I had a bit of a rocky time with drugs, and I think this course might have helped back then or I've seen my symptoms improve since I've been taking, um, being more regularly taking my medication. My meds are now something I feel more positive about. And here you can see exactly what's covered in the course. So the importance of tracking your medication, getting your head around the medication, your relationship with medication, and also how to stay on top of your medication and addressing common bar barriers affecting adherence. So the final course is something that I'm really excited about. And again, this is Acceptance and Commitment Therapy or ACT, which is a form of so-called third wave um, cognitive behavioral therapy, therapy or CBT, which is thought to really help people who might have already tried CBT and perhaps not already had the results that they desired. And studies have shown that on average, ACT can improve people's daily functioning and mood when they have chronic pain. And even at six months after ACT treatment, some improvements have been shown to be maintained. And evidence has also shown it can be useful in reducing anxiety and depressive symptoms. And again, this was developed by Dr. Yelise Pryor and also Dr. Whitney Scott, who is a clinical psychologist and researcher who has dedicated over 10 years to chronic pain research and the past six years specifically looking at ACT um, for hopefully helping with chronic pain. And you can see quotes here from people as well. I now feel like I have the tools to face life and be more like the kind of person I want to be when things are difficult. And so again, this really, this um, course really draws on aspects of, for example, mindfulness and being present, doing what matters, and hopefully as well, developing a new mindset. So you're more than just your thoughts, feelings, and bodily sensations. So to summarise, smartphone apps present an exciting opportunity to help us manage our own health while also facilitating novel research. Harnessing the power of remote monitoring will be critical in coming years to hopefully improve healthcare delivery, reduce um, wait times and get people the help they need quicker. It's a unique opportunity for you to collaborate on development of a novel AXPAR app with the RNHRD. So please do feel free to reach out to me at any time if you're interested or you would like to know more. So I'll leave um, this slide up just in case you want to take my contact details. And yeah, hopefully I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Rosie. Um, firstly, uh, yeah, thank you so much. That was so much information, but really, really interesting and, and great to see so much information about the actual project and, and the study, but also the results that are coming out already and that huge data set. Um, it's really exciting and yeah, exciting to see what's going to come next as well. Um, and really great to go through the apps that are currently available too. Um, hopefully everyone's had a chance to take down your contact details there. So I can pop it in the video description afterwards as well. Um, so if you want to take your slides down, we can um, go through any questions that have come in as well. Yeah, that sounds great. Sorry, I sort of raced through all of that. I know it's a lot of information, but hopefully it's if it's on YouTube as well, if people are interested, they can hopefully go back and have a look at things in a bit more detail. And yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it will stay stay on our Facebook page afterwards. And, you know, as you say, on YouTube and on our mm -hmm. website on My Yes, My Life. So people, as you say, people can go back and pause on the, um, you know, the data slides and have a really good look through. Oh, cool. Brilliant. So um, we've had we've had a couple of questions coming through. So anyone watching, please do um, pop your questions 
in the comments box and we'll go through all of them. Um, firstly, Robin um, has said, you know, thank you for sharing because he's found it really interesting and he's really liked sort of your, your energy and your knowledge as well. Um, and he actually um, helps with a large MSK charity going through funding applications. So I said it may well be that you want to get in contact with each other afterwards. Um, oh, thank you so much. That would be great. Brilliant. And, and we've got Ampersand Health on here as well. Hi, hi to the oh, team. <laughs> Thanks for joining. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, we're getting quite a few thank yous coming through. Um, and we did have a question beforehand, which I think you answered during the session, but just, just good to clarify for anyone who is at the RNHRD and they're taking part in Project Nightingale. I think you said that they can access the full data set um, and the clinicians can access that as well, can't they? Yeah, they can. So um, unfortunately on the app, you can only see it for 90 days, um, your, your data that you've entered. But if you do get in contact with me, I can send you a full readout of the data. And yeah, your clinician at the RNHRD, so Raj can actually access this data during your appointment. However, if you're seeing other clinicians as well outside of the RNHRD, unfortunately, where it is an RNHRD based study, they can't actually see your data. But yeah, hopefully, um, if you do want to see it, please do get in touch and I can just send that data through for you. Oh, it's really helpful. Thank you. Um, and we've had a question from Gerald asking, um, will the AXFAR patient focus group be limited to those treated out of the RNHRD? Um, no, so anyone, anyone can join that. <laughs> Brilliant. That sounds really exciting to be able to, to get views from everyone and help, help get the, the ball rolling and get the ideas going for that app as well. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, and just checking any other questions as well. Um, Oh, we had um, Sarah, who's a patient at the RNHRD, um, watching online as well, and she said it was really interesting to see the research that's going on there as well. Um, so thank you for sharing all of that. Oh, um, thank you. We haven't got any any questions coming through at the moment. We've got a few people saying thank you, and um, I think you're going to get a few emails after the session as well. So <laughs> hopefully lots of people getting involved with your focus groups and, and getting some more data as well. Oh, that would be excellent. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, I really look forward to hearing from you. <laughs> and was there anything else that you wanted to share as well? Um, I mean, I, I know you gave us loads of information there, but any, any final thoughts? <laughs> um, not really, just again, yeah, obviously um, remote tools and using sort of um, tracking applications can be really good. But again, yeah, do remember to be kind to yourself. And if, if you don't reach those goals, um, yeah, don't be too hard on yourself. <laughs> I think that, yeah, that's really important to recognise. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and actually one thing that I found particularly fascinating was how um, the apps can, you know, you mentioned that actually it can give you data that you wouldn't necessarily get, some insights that you don't necessarily get from the clinical appointment. So it's really, really adding something to it as well. Yeah, fingers crossed. I know in future, I mean, obviously this work um, is very much still in its infancy, but hopefully it will lay the foundations for in future trying to work out exactly what the consequences are of those differences that we're picking up and these really subtle changes. Um, so yeah, there's lots we can do in future. So hopefully Absolutely. maybe in future I can come back and talk about it again yes, once we know a bit yeah. more. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, because I imagine you have to get that real foundation of the knowledge first before you can then get more insights from that. Yeah. Brilliant. So yeah, we're getting lots more thank yous and, and hi to Steve who's just joining um, and he said he's going to catch up later as well. So yeah, anyone who's just caught up partway through, please do come back and um, the video will stay on the page so you can catch up on everything afterwards. Brilliant. Well, we've not had any more questions come through, so um, I think we'll finish up there for now. Is there anything else that you wanted to, to add? Um, no, just thank you so much, everyone, for joining. And thank you so much, um, Zoe and Nas, as well, for the opportunity to, to talk about our work. Oh, you're welcome. We really appreciate it. It's um, absolutely fascinating. And I think, you know, someone with Axe myself as well, it's really nice to know there's so much important um, work going on as well. It gives you lots of hope for the future as well. Yeah, definitely. Brilliant. And thanks so much for the great presentation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so um, I'll let everyone know for our, our next session. Um, we've got next week on Wednesday at 1 p.m. I'll be chatting with Dom Armston from the Psoriasis Association. So we'll be talking all about how axial spa can affect your skin. So do tune in for that one, either live or again, you can catch up afterwards. So thanks again, Rosie. It's been fantastic. Um, and keep well, everyone, and see you next week. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.